So we'll move now on to um, our next uh, uh, couple of talks. Uh, if you see the agenda and online and sketch, there's uh, bios uh, for, for all, the, all, all the speakers today. Uh, but uh, for our first uh, speaker, I'm uh, very pleased uh, to be able to uh, introduce uh, Kristen Rattan, who is from the COCO Foundation. And uh, Kristen's been involved in scholarly communications for, for many years. And uh, she's, at, she's been at PLOS and Adipon uh, and, and uh, Highwire and other organizations, but she was also, in her time at PLOS, uh, she was a Crossref board member. So it's nice to uh, have, her, uh, have her back today. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Ed, and thank you for having me here. Um, as Ed mentioned, my name is Kristen Rattan, and I am the co-founder and executive director of the Collaborative Knowledge Foundation, which we call COCO for short. Um, and we build open source uh, tools and community around those tools to transform how research is communicated. COCO just turned three this month, so we're really excited to, uh, to be able to celebrate our third birthday and also um, at the, uh, the amount of progress we've made in our mission uh, during that time period. So I'm gonna talk a little about publishing infrastructure and my time at Adipon and Highwire and at PLOS, I spent a lot of time working on building and, um, and connecting up uh, different infrastructures in the publishing industry and um, probably made some of the, the mistakes we're all living with today. And what, what I've found during this time is, you know, it's 2018, and I think a lot of us expected to have made further progress in terms of how research is communicated, um, in terms of really representing the work that researchers have done in a much more complete and dynamic way. Um, that the web has, you know, grown exponentially in many, many different directions and, and many innovations have occurred. Um, and, and yet we haven't really captured all of those in scholarly communication. A lot of us felt by now that we would have moved out of a static article representation into a more networked and dynamic representation of research with all of the parts and pieces and bits communicated and tied together and a sort of changing and dynamic story occurring as the work is added to and as it evolves. Um, but publishers have been mired in print paradigms, um, old business models, legacy infrastructure. And because of that, Research is being communicated fairly slowly. Um, not all of it is being communicated, and most of it is still closed or behind some sort of access wall of some kind. So increasingly, the demand on us is going to be to improve this. Um, and to do that, we need to break out of the various silos that we've created. And I've been in and around the industry for 20 years, so I'm, I'm speaking with experience having been a part of the creation of the mess that we're in. But we've built content silos, branding silos, we have siloed people, and we have siloed platforms. Um, and I would say that that has resulted in siloed metadata, which is something that this meeting is hoping to address. And all of that has resulted in massive challenges in trying to truly represent what's occurring in the research world in a way that the public can benefit from. We need to consider some of our formatting choices, choices that got made early, early on in the early days of the web. Um, we made decisions around what sort of things we would trust and what sort of things we wouldn't. And in doing that, We've now created workflows and platforms and tools and technologies and whole jobs and whole industries that we're living with and have never really gone back to reconsider. Um, we need to reconsider those standards. We need to reconsider our formats. We need to think beyond where we've been in the past. Be, by holding on to print as long as we have, we've held on to a lot of other processes, uh, typesetting, cost structures, um, and, uh, and just really an entire legacy workflow that has delayed the, the communication of research. So I think increasingly we will be called upon in the industry to speed up research communication. A recent report from the uh, UN said that we have 12 years to solve climate change. Um, I think if it takes 12 months to, to, to 
produce an article on that, we won't really make that deadline. And I think we'll see more and more pressure, um, in addition to the pressure to be open, there will be pressure to be fast. Um, and, in, and in doing that, also complete, presenting the entire body of work, all of the data, the methods, the protocols, the code that went into it, all of the information about collaborators and funding, all will need to be done appropriately. And so we'll be called upon to do that more and more. The pressure will only increase in our industry. And the question is, is what are we going to do about that? So I propose that we think, rethink the infrastructure that we work with entirely. Infrastructure is by no means the only piece of this that needs to be solved. There are many other pieces and parts. But it is the piece and part that this group knows the most about and has a potential to actually solve. And I'm going to propose that in order to change that, we need to think about sharing infrastructure. We need to think about what it would look like if most of the infrastructure upon which we rest is shared. So right now, if you were to pull the layers apart in the average publishing silos, say for example, most of these layers would be siloed individual layers by publisher. Maybe there's some layers that are shared, Crossref, ORCID, data site, these are tools and technologies that do run across the entire uh, industry, but most of what we do is fairly siloed. So if we flipped that and we said, say, let's have 90% of our infrastructure as shared infrastructure and only a 10% layer at the top that was customized, that was personalized to your organization, that 10% is enough. That's where your brand is. That's where your identity is. That's where your differentiation is. That's all you need in order to be a shining example in the business. The common infrastructure underneath that hood can be humming along and being far more efficient if it were shared across organizations. And other industries have done this. Most other industries have done this, actually. In telecom, most of the infrastructure is shared. Um, in banking, they've created all sorts of ways to communicate. They've cleaned their metadata up. It all happens seamlessly behind the scenes. Even the airline industry, and I was just complaining about my flights getting here. There was no Wi-Fi. There was a delay. I had to run through an airport. They actually let me get on the wrong airplane. I boarded a plane that was going to Houston, and I only found out when I got to my seat, and I was like, some guy's in my seat. I said, you're in my seat. And he held up his boarding pass, and it said Houston. And I just knew <laughs> I'm on the wrong airplane. So the infrastructure we know isn't perfect in the airline industry, and yet it is, it, for the complexity of it, it relies on a combination of public and private, open and closed infrastructure that's global. And it actually, given the complexity, doesn't always work terribly. So it's kind of a sad state of affairs when we're behind the airline industry when it comes to being innovative around shared infrastructure. Where we do have success is in this room. Uh, Crossref is a huge example of that success. We did invest back in 2000, I believe, is when Crossref started, um, in this idea that we should share the linking, the cross-referencing between different articles and create this thing called the DOI. And then Datacite and ORCID and others, I think this is where we do have success, and it's success that we can build on. And one of the reasons that publishers were willing to invest in this shared layer was because it didn't feel threatening. You know, it felt like a no-brainer. It wasn't going to actually change much about their content or their brand or their, the amount of authors, that the types of authors they attracted, their impact factors, et cetera. But I would say that most infrastructure falls into that category today, particularly when, as we've said, the web has moved on in leaps and bounds. Publishing is still back, publishing as if it were 1999. Um, I think we have the opportunity to, to leap ahead if we rely on up, updating all of that infrastructure, building on this early success of Crossref. Um, and I will take another step and propose that this shared infrastructure be open source. And uh, the reason that I say that is, first of all, it's we are doing what we are doing for the public good. The public largely pays for it. And so having open infrastructure that can be reutilized by others in the public domain is probably a good look for us. Um, but I'd also say that it's just a smart business decision. Most of the web runs on open source core technologies. At least 75% of websites run on WordPress or one of the other open source content management systems. Um, the open source, all the browsers run off of core open source technology. Android is like, I don't know, something like 70 or 80% of the phones in the world run off of the Android open source uh, 
tool. Um, and so there's, a, there's just a huge proliferation of open source as underneath the hood across the web. Um, and yet we have very little of it in our industry. Um, and by the way, telecom runs off of OpenStack, which is an open source alternative to Amazon Web Services for cloud hosting. Um, the entire telecom industry has, and the banking industry have adopted that as their cloud hosting instead of working with Amazon because it's less, less expensive and they can control it. So they've made very smart businesses, business decisions to invest collectively in open source, even though they're competing head to head at the level of their brands and services, they know that under the hood, they can actually collaborate and create this shared infrastructure. Um, and so other industries have done it. Other industries have made the leap to open source. And we haven't yet. So I think this is something to consider and, um, uh, and, and to investigate. Um, I think we need to think about what happens if we don't invest in shared open infrastructure. And we've seen a lot of mergers and acquisitions in the industry recently. We've seen things change rapidly. Some things have broken or gone out of business. There's always a risk to investing in a, um, in a commercial or proprietary technology. Um, but, you know, those things can happen regardless. But I think if you think even more, there will be more and more questions about who owns what in this industry. And in particular, who owns the data? So who owns the infrastructure is one question. Who owns a platform or a piece of technology is something we should be considering. But the data that flow through that, so the data about who's researching what and who's going to publish on something and who's collaborating with whom and where this work is occurring and how soon it's going to come out. And um, th those kinds of data are going to be more and more critical. And who owns that data? That's the data that you shepherd. Researchers place their information in your hands to shepherd to take you know, and nurture through a process that then results in publication. They place that trust in you, but they're also placing their entire identity and all of their data about all of their work in your hands. And at this point, I'm not sure we even all know who owns that data. So investing in shared open infrastructure means we can control exactly who owns that data and all of those processes and all of the technologies that go with it and we can build services off of those that hopefully promote the public good um, and make research work better. So we've seen a lot in the larger industry on the web where things have been hacked and there have been data breaches and all sorts of security issues have come up. And it's because these black box platforms are kind of an unknown. And again, investing in community-owned open infrastructure gives us the opportunity to address those things before they happen. So how does it work? Um, essentially, the way we're going about this at COCO is um, you have a number of core open source projects that begin. People start building really interesting things. They have a purpose. They have uh, developers. And they begin to build in the open, meaning that the code is shared as soon as it's appropriate to share, as early as possible in the process. And then you start to attract some early adopters. You start to get people who are interested in working side by side and even contributing their own code to the mix. You work very tightly together to make sure that the, all the code is as reusable as possible and useful to other organizations as possible. You partner with others who are building technologies as well so that things can be done in an interoperable way. Then you get your first wave of adoption. Those who are saying, hey, this is a new approach and it's a new technology. It's modern, it's up to date, it's scalable, it's everything I want. And hey, it's being done in the open, which means it's basically free to use with minor you know, con contributions to keep it afloat. And so there's this first wave of adoption. And usually those are the more techie organizations that are ready to jump in and download the code. Um, you begin to attract funders and stakeholders into this space, and right now there's a huge push among funders to fund open infrastructure. Um, and we've been spending a lot of time in the library community where there's been an enormous push to move from proprietary uh, to open infrastructure. There have been acquisitions there as well, and there's some concerns about, um, about who owns the data rel related to um, uh, universities and institutions. 
And then you start to attract service providers. So we know that most people don't want to pick up a piece of code and run with it, right? They're not necessarily prepared to do that. They don't have the in-house technology and tech teams to do that. And that's certainly true in the publishing industry where most of this has been outsourced for a long time. So what you need in this space is an ecosystem of service providers who are willing to create services on this technology to monetize it, essentially. Um, there have been criticisms around open source that it doesn't, that it sort of kills commercial and, uh, and uh, entities or enterprises, and nothing could be further from the truth. What it does is open up a whole range of opportunities for people to create commercial or nonprofit services around the technologies. And then once you have service providers in the mix creating turnkey solutions for all the different markets in the space, that's when you get broad adoption. So this is the trajectory that we're currently trying to seed at the moment. And why we started Coco three years ago was to begin to build these various different things and hopefully attract other builders to the space uh, to create open source solutions that would replace the infrastructure that we have today. So we have three platform use cases we're working on right now. Uh, one for books called Editoria, uh, one for journals called XPub, and a platform that um, produces very rapid short form publications like micropubs, minipubs, data pubs, etc. These are all in different stages uh, right now. Um, the books platform, we now have an, about a half a dozen pilots, people using a hosted version. On the journal pl platform, eLife and Hindawi have been partnering with us, and Hindawi launched their first journal uh, in September. The way we've built um, is specifically in a very modular way. We've built a framework that can hold lots of different modules, and then we've built components that do different specific tasks. And we've done this so that other people can build into the ecosystem alongside us. That way everybody can take and, and own their own components if they want to, or they can mix and match those that are already there to create custom solutions. It breaks down that silo completely, that concept of technology as a silo. But we don't believe that we should be the only ones in this, doing this. We, we, would, we are hoping to and have already attracted a number of other open source builders. We want there to be a range of choices. One of the challenges we've faced in publishing is a one-to-one -one relationship between a platform and a service provider. Um, our current platform service providers only offer their own technology. They don't offer the technology of others. And there aren't multiple service providers offering their technology. We've got what's known as vendor lock-in. So if you create a many-to-many -many situation where there are lots of different platforms and lots of different tools that can fit into those platforms, then you can create lots of service layers on top of that. And then people can mix and match and create services to meet the needs of niche markets, of emerging or changing markets. They can create custom solutions, um, and they can build into the space much more rapidly. This keeps vendor lock-in from happening, but it also keeps it, it breeds innovation frankly, because suddenly people who are experts in one thing can go and build that one thing beautifully, and it'll fit into the ecosystem. And people can benefit by that expertise. If Crossref hadn't developed the expertise that it had on DOIs and metadata as early as it did, we wouldn't have been able to rely on that. What we want is an ecosystem where there are many of those solutions occurring, and they have a home and an environment into which they can fit. And we're beginning to see this work already with a lot of different point solutions for peer review or for in-browser editing or digital-first workflow tools, um, things like that. So the way to do this, the key to all of this, turns out, is people. Open source is people. Open source is community. Um, and we, we knew this coming into it, but I think we didn't realize how critical it was going to be to really foster and nurture the community and to get people together to solve problems collaboratively in the same space real time. Um, because often software has been built off in a garage somewhere or somebody's basement and a couple of people have done it alone and then they've said, ta-da, I built this thing, don't you love it? And maybe you do and maybe you don't, but that's pretty much how it's usually been done. Um, and so now building in the open and building as a community has been a, it's a real, it's a radical change. Um, and we've been at it now for a few years, so I can safely say it's working. It's been great. People are actually using each other's code in very, very interesting ways. And they're able to say, ah, you've got that piece. I don't have to worry about that. You're working on it. As long as you do it in this way that would help me, I can use yours. And you can use 
use this thing I'm over here that I'm working on. And so we have to, to, in order to make that work, we have to actually get together regularly. We have constant meetings. The tech teams work side by side. Um, they, they're in contact with each other all the time. And these are tech teams that are working across multiple organizations. So this has been a real, uh, a fascinating experiment in collaborative software development. Um, and it, it can only really happen in an open source environment. So this is just a, a representative set of the partners that we've got, um, because we've actually added quite a few more since then. Um, but it's been really wonderful on the journal side to see eLife and Hindawi and the University of California Press Journal Calabra uh, working closely with us to, um, from the beginning, make the XPUB journal platform a incredibly uh, fast, digital first, modern application for manuscript submission and peer review. Uh, we've also got projects uh, that will automate production work and typesetting. And we've got a books platform, um, uh, as well as I mentioned, this mini pub or micro pub platform. So it's been a, um, uh, an, an interesting first few years. And now we're at the point where we are working with potential service providers to gather up this and offer it as a turnkey end to end solution for publishers who don't wish to get in there with the code and don't have a technology team to do that. So over the next year, we'll be able to package up all of this work into things that are fairly easy to use, easy to adopt, um, and out there as an alternative to existing um, platforms and services. So with that, I will end. Um, I hope that you'll join us and, uh, and investigate how shared and open infrastructure can be transformative in the industry as well as within your organizations. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just had a question about what you see the uh, sort of trajectory for, for Coco and sort of, uh, you know, you mentioned that, you know, publishers invested in Crossref originally and then, and then Orchid and, and Datasite, although that wasn't publishers directly, but publishers really kicked off Orchid, uh, uh, but that's broadened too, which is nice. But I was just thinking with Coco, you know, I think you've largely been grant funded and just what you see for Cocoa itself maybe going forward the next couple of years in terms of your sustainability potential? Yeah, it's a great question. So initially we've been largely grant funded, although not entirely. Um, we've also have earned income directly from publishers who have invested in us building things they wanted to build. Um, it, over time, and now we're getting sponsorships. So um, actually we'll be announcing our first sponsor in, uh, in, next, in the next month. And those are publishers who have decided that they are, they're all in that this technology is gonna be critical to their success moving forward. And so what we created is the opportunity for them to donate a fixed amount annually, not a lot, a very small amount compared to what they pay for a platform. And that helps to cover the cost of maintaining the code base, fixing bugs, these community meetings that we're having. And so we're seeing an increasing willingness from publishers who have decided that they're gonna rely on the technology that we're all building to sort of uh, con contribute into a shared pot uh, that will fund that technology moving forward. And then we have custom development contracts with people who are interested in us building a new thing. I'm like, okay, we love what you're doing, but we want this other thing over here. We'll pay your, you as a developing development shop to build that thing. Um, we do consulting as well. So we're seeing an increase in the amount of earned income that we have, which as a nonprofit is really the the path to sustainability as you, you know, move off of grant funding onto various different ways. The community itself wants to, to pay into this and get things out that they're interested in. So that's our trajectory. We've been very fortunate with the amount of earned income we've had relative to grant funding. Um, it's ranged from, you know, we've been, you know, 50 to 70% grant funded each year. It kind of goes up and down. But that's a fairly high amount of earned income for a uh, new nonprofit. And ultimately, I mean, the amount that publishers are spending on infrastructure today is, is super high. 
um, because you've got to count not just the cost of a platform, but what it costs for you to use it, uh, the cost of the services that you're using, um, the things that you use to fill the gaps that the platform doesn't do, uh, or platforms. And, and so that cost is significantly high. I would venture to say we could take 10% of what everyone in uh, all the publishers in this room are spending and still do far better with just 10% of that cost if we invested in shared open infrastructure. And I think that's what would radically transform the space. And I think it's what would actually give the public what they want, which is very rapid and complete open information. Um, and I think the only way to free up the resources to get us there is to invest in that 10% that into shared infrastructure. Any other questions? Thank you very much.